Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for Hanger Clinic's virtual classroom series designed for medical professionals. The virtual classroom idea truly was inspired by so many of you reaching out and looking for creative ways for our teams to continue to engage during this time. I see so many familiar faces out there in the crowd, as well as some new ones um, joining us today. So thank you so much for joining. Let's get started. If you have attended a few other sessions, you may have already met several folks with us today who are supporting the classroom throughout the series. So this is just for any new folks joining us for this session. So we've got myself, I am Lily Kamraus. I'm the Professional Education Manager for Hanker Clinic. And also you'll see Mike Gano, a DC Area Manager, and Mike Benning, Team Leader of our Patient Ambassador Program. You may see these folks help you monitor questions throughout. So thanks so much, guys, for joining us. Now real quick, just some housekeeping items for you all. You should all see your control panel on the right-hand side. You'll be able to adjust your experience. You can move that orange arrow and toggle that control panel back and forth. You can even adjust your own webcam view. So if you've got slides or if you wanna see the presenters a little more, you can adjust that view on your screen. Handouts, we do have one handout in that handout section. We've got the manuscript here for you guys today. Questions. If any questions do come up throughout the, uh, the session, feel free to type those into the question box you see there in your control panel. Our team, our uh, two mics, will be helping to monitor those for our speakers. CE contact hours, if you guys are interested, you'll receive an email communication with links to submit your credit request and complete the course evaluation for your certificate. So we wanted to do just a quick poll for us to see who's out there. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this real quick for us. So let's see who's out there today. All right, so that poll, let's see. Go ahead and identify whether you are an OMP provider, are you a physician, maybe you're a physical therapist, maybe you're a researcher or a nurse or case manager. Go ahead and select your option there on your screen. You should be able to go ahead and select that for us. We see a lot of folks inputting their information, great. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that for us now. And we're gonna share that with you all. So we've got 48% OMP providers out there. We've got 3% physicians, 38 physical therapists. We do have some researchers out there for us, 6% and then 4% nurses and case managers. Um, I think maybe some other folks also input their, their profession there in the questions box. So thank you guys so much for for joining us here today. All right, so back to our session. So now that we know a little bit about who's out there, I'm not as really, you know, for Michelle, Shane, Jim, hopefully you guys just have get some good insight into who's out in the audience now. Let's get into our session. The impact study, early prosthetic delivery shown to reduce overall direct healthcare costs. And I'm excited to bring to the virtual stage, Michelle Denning, who's going to take it from here as our moderator for today's session. So Michelle, are you there? And the floor is all yours. I am a physical therapist and graduated from St. Louis University many moons ago, and then went back to school for health systems administration at Georgetown. I currently am the Area Business Operations Manager for Hangar and work within the Mid-Atlantic region to help drive our hospital partnerships as well as our clinical outcomes. So being a PT and working so closely with this population for so many years, I'm hoping in this session to not only discuss this new study, but also to bring to the forefront how this is going to be impacting our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'd like to begin today by introducing you to the rest of our panelists. And I'd like to start with Mr. Jim Weber. Jim is the co-founder, president, and CEO of p and Care in St. Louis, Missouri, and is the immediate past president of the American Orthotic and Prosthetic Organization, excuse me, Association, <laughs> AOPA an organization that is committed to investing in advancing research within the profession and helping define the value proposition of the OMP professions within healthcare. Jim has served as AOPA's past treasurer from 2009 to 2014, wherein 
2007, Jim organized and acted as the treasurer for the Missouri Coalition for People with Limb Loss. This coalition was responsible for Missouri becoming the 17th state to successfully pass prosthetic parity legislation in 2009. So he continues to advocate for prosthetics throughout the region and nationally. And he earned his BSBA in finance from the University of Missouri and his MBA from St. Louis University. So go Bullikens and welcome Jim. Thank you, I'd like Michelle. to turn now and introduce, of course, I'd like to introduce everyone to Dr. Shane Werdeman. After receiving a bachelor's degree in physics, Dr. Werdeman decided to enter the profession of OMP as a technician and earned a master's degree in prosthetics and orthotics. After working as a prosthetist and orthotist, he went back to school for his PhD in biomechanics. He's published numerous studies in peer-reviewed journals, presented in over 50 abstracts at various national conferences, published several book chapters in prosthetics and biomechanics, and currently serves on AOPA's board as the, excuse me, board of directors as the chair of research. Shane is also the clinical director of research here at Hanger, and he works within the field of clinical and scientific affairs. So in addition to all of this, he also continues to see patients. So hi, Shane. Thanks for joining. Hey, Michelle. Hey. So now, Jim, I'd like to turn to you, and thank you both again for joining. I'd like you to start off by providing us with a bit of background and definition for the triple aim of healthcare for those participants who may not be as familiar with the initiative, and then, more importantly, talk about how triple aim of healthcare and what it means for the impact on the ONP profession. So, Jim? All right. Thanks, Michelle. So, as Michelle mentioned, I uh, graduated from you a few months just a few months before Michelle did but uh, I'm a business person business major as a business and finance and uh, was fortunately invited into the OMP profession and management position back in 1991 actually so at that time it was pretty rare as most of uh, those in our profession know that a business person was invited to the management level it was many times run by the clinic managers that were CPs or CEOs and at that time, it was I didn't I didn't realize that it just being new to the industry, but uh, it was um, an opportunity for me to get involved with a very uh, rewarding profession from my perspective. At that same time, ironically, in 1991, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, was actually organized. 1991. It followed uh, some some uh, research by led by Dr. Don Berwick focused on the improvement of the US healthcare system. At the time, back in the 80s and 90s, we had unsustainable costs, recognizing them even that time, 30 years ago, and in trying to control errors and waste in the healthcare system, they had initiated many studies based on science, and this came to the formation of the IHI. So that was almost 30 years ago that the focus on healthcare improvement um, was necessary and it still is obviously necessary today. Our profession today is fortunately more focused on this particular aspect of improvement in healthcare. As many of us know, 30 years ago, we were just learning what an L code was. I mean, they were just formed in the late 70s and 80s and our profession was adopting that as a billing system for O&P for how we provided the care that we knew as professionals provided the necessary care for the patients that we saw every day. And we saw the improvement in their lives and improvement in their health. And we assume from that, that their better care is continued through their lower healthcare costs. But these are assumptions back then, as they were for the next 20 years or more for our particular profession. In the 2000s, you know, it was from a OMP perspective, there, you know, you, you continue to see the billing of the L code system, and it, it there was evolutions of it as how we build it. But as far as from the payer standpoint, we were less than a half a percent of the overall spend from Medicare, and and on a payer private that probably uh, you know correlates to what private payers were. So we weren't really necessarily recognized. 2011, uh, everyone remembers the physician doc letter. We became we were. All suddenly on the radar of all payers from Medicare's physician doc letter, which basically focused on ONP as a profession and what we were billing. We know the audits that followed and everything from that perspective from just less than 10 years ago. 
This is a highlight of why this study today is so critically important. We were pretty much you know, behind the eight ball when it came to having the science necessary. I'm really, um, I'm pleased to see 6% researchers out there today on this particular webinar. I would bet you 15 years ago, we wouldn't have any researchers here. And in O&P as a profession, we all know what we do. We love what we do and we see what we see as the improvement of healthcare in each of our patients every day. And coincidentally, at about that same time, the IHI had redirected their thinking and actually organized the triple aim of healthcare. You may have never heard of the triple aim of healthcare, but you've all lived it. In your, in your particular healthcare profession, it has been part of your life, whether you know it or not. And that the, the IHI and the continuing study of improvement of healthcare developed this framework, and it is a triple aim, that it's focused on the health of a population, it's focused on the experience of the care of the individuals within that population, and it's focused on the per capita cost of providing that care. But the fact it's called a triple aim is a bit of a misnomer because it's truly single focus on all three pillars. And so it, as you advance in your own profession, this is, this is something that is related to you in an OMP profession and therapists, physicians, hospitals. It's, it's, there's various focuses within the US healthcare system. You see the triple aim can be to apply to an ACO system, the bundled payment initiatives from Medicare. Many different focuses which incorporate the triple aim are more successful in taking the overall care of the individual, the population, and hopefully the per capita cost. So from our perspective in this study today, I'm particularly grateful for, for Dr. Werdeman inviting me to participate in this from the perspective of, our, of the OMP profession, because the work that Hanger has done in the leadership of Dr. Jim Campbell and, and their team benefits us all. And I am particularly grateful for sharing this information with everyone. AOPA's been obviously very involved in research and funds fund studies every year, significant studies in the past relative to the, to the focus of our care. But this is something that Hanger took on and, and it, it, any study like this, which is particular relative to how we affect the direct per capita cost of the healthcare, not just what we do, but their total cost during the time that they are fit and we see them as patients and continue to see them through their whole lives is critical to proving our, our value and what we do going forward. We have to have science for O&P to be verified and valued in the healthcare system in the continuum that we work in. Thank you, Jim. Well said. And thanks for illuminating us about the triple aim of healthcare. Providers and administrators I know on this call have experienced the changes that you're referring to through these years of healthcare. And I know that, as you rightly point out, O&P is right now in the midst of experiencing these changes in which other aspects of healthcare have experienced in years before. When I think as a PT, Historically treating patients, the ability to treat a patient was based mostly on a clinician's judgment as to what provisions were required to assist that patient. Nowadays, we know we're in an environment where there are finite resources to our healthcare. And as a result, it's up to us as providers, the onus is to provide the necessary information and to prove the efficacy of intervention that we're going to provide to our patients. So this was an important, important point that you were making. I know as a PT nowadays, I can't imagine treating a patient without the inclusion of this objective data so that there's some real information in which they can understand what it is we need to do for these patients. So thank you. When I consider the triple aim in this particular population, I think about how are we going to optimize the clinical uh, the clinical outcome these patients experience? How do we improve that clinical experience? And then do that all within that framework of being cognizant of cost. So one of the examples I consider is this collaborative approach that more and more of us are taking, and certainly within Hanger and within many of our hospital partnerships. And I'll give you an example. In DC, we work with a multidisciplinary clinic weekly where we bring together physicians, we bring together the patient, the therapist, and the prosthetist to develop a very cohesive form of plan that patient doesn't leave the clinic until they have the prescriptions in hand that they need, the documentation required, and the confirmed appointments for any follow-up services. With the simple goal is we wanna make it easy, accessible, and efficient for these patients to engage in their recovery. Because if we know we can break down those barriers, we can help optimize this patient's ability to obtain the outcome that we all want. So I thank you for that. And now I wanna to turn to Jim a little bit because Jim, thanks for helping, or excuse me, 
for setting the stage and helping us talk about some of these next questions. Shane, if we pivot towards you, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the recent study of the impact? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Michelle. And Jim, excellent uh, comments. I, I really appreciated hearing that. It's kind of setting the framework there. Um, you know, and, and before I get started, uh, I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge my co-authors on this study. Um, this is definitely the work of, of a group. Um, and in particular, I'll point out Ms. Tavi Miller, who I'm very proud to have on our team. Uh, she's a critical aspect of this work. Uh, her, her background as a health economist uh, is, is really helping our team advance this kind of work. So, um, you know, I think your comments, Jim, about, you know, we're living triple aim per se is, is partly why we took on this work is, you know, anecdotally, we see our patients that get their prosthesis, they get up, they get moving, and, and we in the patient room see those benefits. And, and it's almost intuitive that if this person is up and moving and doing better, then surely they're not having the same kind of health complications as someone that is sitting in a chair and, and not able to get up and get moving. Uh, and, and so that's really kind of what was the genesis of, of starting to look at this and, and see if this does actually translate to savings in terms of direct healthcare costs. Um, what we what we have here is we were able to analyze data from IBM Watson Truven Healthcare. So IBM Watson has a uh, true, formerly Truven Healthcare has a database that is comprised of they they advertise nearly 25% of all commercially covered lives in the U.S. Uh, and goes for several decades, they've got all this data, and what this means is that if your, uh, if your insurance plan is one of the 300 plus that contributes to this database, then your, all of your claims are, are in this database. Now it's completely de-identified, um, but it, it is a national database. It's a, it is not just solely hanger patients, this will be all individuals. We were able to go in and we were able to get our hands on uh, 2014 through 2016 data. And we, we asked them for individuals that uh, maintain continuous coverage uh, through that period. So if you're gonna look at total healthcare costs, you wanna make sure that the person's in there for that entire period that you're looking at. We got those individuals and then we subsequently whittled it down to just individuals that had an amputation during that period. It had to be a primary amputation, so um, not, not necessarily toe or, or digit, but we we're looking at uh, really transfemoral or transtibial level. And once we had those individuals, uh, we then, recognizing the, the clinical evidence out there for earlier fitting of a prosthesis, we, we started to separate the individuals based on how soon they received their prosthesis. You go in, and what we ended up seeing was after amputation, grouped them into four different bins. Uh, individuals that were zero to three months after their amputation, they received their prosthesis. And then you had four to six months, seven to nine months, and then last uh, 10 to 12 months. Now there was also within this cohort, group of individuals that never received a prosthesis. So that was actually our fifth group that we, that we analyzed. Went in and from the date of their amputation, we go in and we, summed up all of their direct healthcare costs. So these are, within this database, you have all of their claims. So that's inpatient and outpatient. The other thing that's significant is that these, these claims, you have, uh, it's really their pay. So it's not, not just cost, it's fully adjudicated claims. So this is not their negotiated rates. It's not um, you know, usual customary type of, of fees. It's, it's really what was actually paid after all the uh, contract negotiating. So we're able to sum all that up for 12 months. We also summed up the three months prior to their amputation. And the reason we did that was to enter it as a potential confounding variable. So what I mean by that is we wanted to enter it into our statistics to really understand, you know, if someone is a little bit more sick and requiring more health care, we're really trying to look at how does the prosthesis and, and the timing of the prosthesis really change the trajectory of that, that health care spend for that individual. Um, by entering that, and then we also looked at an, uh, entered into it uh, um, whether or not the person had diabetes or vascular disease. You know, again, that, that is based on, on a lot of evidence uh, as well as anecdotal experience just with the general health nature of these individuals. Um, although it is worth noting that the general ratio of individuals, diabetic vascular disease versus uh, non, uh, within each of these groups was actually um, similar. So, so that in itself 
would take care of it, but we still enter it as a potential confounder in our model. And then when we get to the analysis, what you're seeing here are the results. So you end up seeing first individuals that are zero to three months after amputation. They actually ultimately, in the 12 months after their amputation, there's a reduced direct healthcare spend. Uh, it's you could say that essentially it, it affords a 25% cost savings in that 12 months, uh, which equates to approximately a $25,000 saving. That's what we have here is group A. If you go a little bit further out to individuals that are four to six months and seven to nine months, here we found no statistical difference between our group X, the, the gray group, the group that never received the prosthesis. There's no statistical difference. Uh, it wasn't until you got to 10 to 12 months after amputation that you started to see the costs in that 12 months uh, exceed not receiving a prosthesis. But I wanted to take a moment to just touch on this group B and C. Receiving the prosthesis between four and six months and then seven to nine months. There's no difference in, in this total direct cost from zero to uh, from, from the 12 months after amputation. But there is kind of a caveat with that. Remember, these two groups have all of the costs associated with prosthetic rehabilitation. Uh, you do not have that in the group that did not receive a prosthesis. So if you take away all of that, their other or non-prosthetic healthcare spend is less uh, than those that never receive a prosthesis, um, from which you would surmise that overall they, their health benefit uh, is, is better. Um, when, when you're looking at uh, the fact that there's no differences, the other point that's worth noting is, you know, these individuals have, coming back to some of our earlier work, you know, getting a prosthesis, that's gonna give them the ability to enjoy some of the things in terms of quality of life uh, that, that you have with prosthetic mobility. So uh, also another advantage. Um, so uh, with, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Sure, and Shane, I have a question for you. You mentioned twenty-five thousand dollars in cost savings. Do you know what comprises those costs? So, that, so that's actually a really good question yeah, because because it would be great if we go in and we could say, okay, well, if if we can give them this device within the first three months, we see this twenty-five thousand, and that is ultimately a saving in X. But the reality is um, that it, that is a very complex question and probably is. Heterogeneous, uh, uh, heterogeneous as our population is, so would the ultimate result. And what I mean by that is you're going to have different benefits for different people. You have some people that are, mm -hmm. are potentially going to save costs because they're now on a prosthesis instead of one-legged uh, hopping with crutches uh, and falling. Or perhaps it's because of the fact that now they're in prosthetic rehab, they're also in front of a prosthetist. Uh, as well as the physical therapist a lot more, which means they're having a, a trained healthcare specialist put eyes on not just the amputated side, but also their non-amputated side in the event that there is perhaps all of a sudden a diabetic wound that, that comes up. They have someone that's earlier uh, noticing it and, and bringing attention to it so it becomes a much easier uh, remedy versus something that progresses to you know a much more um, expensive and worse uh, wound and potentially even amputation. Um, so ultimately it's it's very complex and there's different benefits for each individual just understanding that it's that getting up and getting moving um, and, and that's really where you're gonna get that. So thank you. Thanks Jim. Jim, perhaps you could touch on this as it refers to the triple aim. So uh, that the, the impact of that $25,000, so to speak. I think um, I started you know, care with my business partner, John Wilson, who's a CPO, probably one of the most passionate uh, clinicians in the whole country. And so every day when we see patients here in our clinics, we assume that what Shane just said, as far as the $25,000, we, we assume that we are improving that patient's care and we're, we're um, we hope that the quality of what we provide is, you know, is going to provide that improvement in his health and her, or her health and reduce their overall health care costs. These are assumptions we made 20 years ago. Today, we have the science behind it. And so when we can impact that $25,000 is population health. 
it's the individual health that's not the direct cost. When we pay for our direct costs within that total dollar, that is a direct impact of population health and per capita cost within it. So we're hoping that in our everyday, as we improve our practices and the and the standards of which by which we practice, that we improve the quality and the experience of our patient. But this type of data proves what we see every day and we feel every day when the relationships that we have with our patients, but it, it is, it's science that says, when we are in the continuum of care with our referring partners that we are managing the rehabilitation of a patient, that to see that value that we bring to the table economically is, is just phenomenal. This is, you know, the fact that this is on private pay, it'd be really interesting to see the next level of study with additional data from more, you know, from the Medicare population, you know, we would, I would assume right away, those would be bigger numbers. But again, those are assumptions and we have to prove it by science. So the triple aim is uh, very applicable to this from every level, the individual patient, the population health, and obviously this is the per capita cost. So very well done, Shane. Thank you. Um, you know, actually, Michelle, you you actually operate in a very uh, busy practice and, and I know that you guys are extremely, uh, extremely good at at getting prosthesis on your patients in a very rapid time. Um, you work with one of the uh, premier uh, surgeons in the, in really the country. And uh, I would love to actually hear how this really kind of plays into what you're seeing within the, the clinics that you're operating in on the East Coast there. Michelle? Uh -oh. Well, we've, we're having some, uh, uh, looks like we're having some A, B. Sure, yeah, sure, absolutely. Just a little bit. You know, oh, when I think about is. what we're trying to do every day. Oh. Sorry, everyone, had a little technical trouble there. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, what we're doing in the in this region specifically is really that collaborative approach to care. And, and really what we're trying to do every single day is deliver care efficiently and successfully to our patients. Think about it on an individual level, but also on a clinic level. On an individual level, many of these patients are presenting with comorbidities, such as CHF, such as COPD, such as vascular and cardiac issues, which we know are negatively impacted by immobility. So think about the fact alone that research shows that with COPD, the strength of your quad muscle is a large determinant of how long you're going to survive with COPD. Because if it's difficult to stand, one stands less. And if one stands less, one moves less. And what happens as a result? These patients tend to become much more immobile. So then when I consider this study, to Shane, your point, and Jim's, what we have now is the objective data that reinforces what we know. These patients need to move. And this is a relatively younger population. Now imagine we're putting in something along the lines of a deconditioned patient on top of everything else that they're experiencing with their comorbidities. We know how hard it is to regain the physiological strength and endurance that's lost through immobility. Now imagine that old adage of for every day of bed rest, you need three days of activity to recover and regain. And we're talking about 90 days, 120 days, it's a huge mountain that these patients have to climb to recover. So that's what I think about every single day when I think about these patients and how do we get them moving. And in DC, on a more of a clinic level, you mentioned uh, the world famous plastic surgeon, Dr. Christopher Adinger. He hosts a twice weekly amputee clinic out of MedStar Georgetown University Hospital where we're embedded. And at that clinic, he sees some of the most complex medically vulnerable patients that you'll come across. And he is committed to the idea that we need to get our patients up and moving. And really one of his goals is as soon as those sutures are out, we establish that patient with a prosthesis as quickly as impossible. We're talking days because he knows that the faster we get these people moving, the longer these people move, the healthier and better their overall outcomes are gonna be. And so one of the things that we think about on that clinic level is proactively identifying those barriers to care that are commonly experienced by these patients. So whether that's a lack of documentation or transportation issues or even mental health, if we can identify and put systems in place that mitigate those challenges, we're going to help mitigate those potential issues that would otherwise derail a patient's potential to return to an ambulatory status. And therefore, 
negate any potential clinical outcomes. So our goal is to make this efficient and collaborative so that we proactively try and solve those issues. So thank you very, very much. But before I wrap up, I just want to turn you to you both and just say, Jim and Shane, is there anything else you'd like to add? I, I know we're running out of time here. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Jim take the last word here. Um, but I want to just say, you know, that's, it's great to hear that what you're talking about in the clinic that really aligns with Jim's comments about how we really are living the triple aim. And, you know, now to start to see numbers that can show the, the dollar aspect that goes with how we practice uh, is, is truly great. You know, and, and I, I actually will close with his last thought because it's important that we're folk, we, we realize this is a study focused on economic value. And there are far, there are many other types of value. Uh, and so when we look at these results, I don't, I don't think we want to walk away from it saying there's no value, in particular for the one group that's 10 to 12 months. Uh, it may not be economic value. It, it may need to be an understanding of the clinical value like you're talking about, Michelle. And, and I think the biggest thing that we need to walk away from this and understand is why is it? that some of these patients are taking that long. What are the obstacles and how do we work as a, as a team, uh, everyone involved in, in the care, to remove those obstacles to get that person their device sooner, make it more economical and give them those clinical benefits sooner. Thank you. And Jim, I'll let you take the last word as our guest here. Thank you. Well, again, I want to thank you, Shane, for the invitation. And Michelle, I appreciate this opportunity to be on this webinar with you as well. And I just I want to finish with a thought from uh, my friend Mo Kenny, who at the leadership conference at AOPA's seminar this January and speaking about the current uh, status of our profession, he said in that where he said, everyone in this room, we may compete in certain markets, so to speak, and from a clinic to clinic standpoint, but we are most importantly colleagues. And the most important thing that we do every day is take care of our patient. And the most important thing from that perspective is that health of that population. And we have a direct impact on it every day. This study helps us to enumerate that and stay what we've known, and we, we've intrinsically believe every day, that this is an example of one piece of work that in, in black and white can say, this is how we affect the overall per capita cost and the health of the population we serve. So it's extremely valuable. And Thank you again to the Panger team for sponsoring this study, and I'm looking forward to similar studies coming from our profession in the near future. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. And I know we're running out of time, so I just want to say thank you all to the participants who are here today with us on the webinar. I hope you're walking away with a wonderful understanding of not only Triple AIM, but its impact on the actual impact study and the impact as well on the profession of ONP. So, Lily, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us. So, and you know, taking the time out of your day, I know quite a few of you have joined us for other sessions and, to, and continuing to join us throughout this series. So thank you so much to our attendees, to our panelists for your time today. So, you know, with that, um, we, we did have a lot of questions come through. Thank you so much for submitting those. We won't have time to get to that. So Shane, Jim and Michelle will share those and kind of figure out a game plan for answering them as follow up to that group that did submit. I'm, I'm going to leave this open maybe for another minute or two to let folks continue to ask those questions also, if that's okay with the panelists. I'll turn off your webcam, get your mics um, uh, muted there, and just leave it open. People can ask questions and, and get their, their last comments in. Um, but with that, everyone, thank you so much for attending. And um, we'll see you all next time. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to Jim. Thank you. Michelle <laughs> and Shane. Bye, guys.